Psalm chapter number 13, Psalm chapter number 13. Psalm chapter number 13, verses 1 through 6 this evening. Psalm chapter number 13. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Bible says in verse number 1, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. Amen. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Right. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully that with right. me. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I pray you'd fill me and use me. God, and direct my words and my thoughts, Lord. And I pray, dear God, that you just work in hearts and lives tonight in a special way. Thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for all that you do in us. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. As we jump right into Psalm chapter number 13, I think we can all relate with David and how he is feeling in this passage. Lehman Strauss is a man who pastored uh, here in America uh, of two notable Baptist churches in his day, and uh, that day would have been uh, probably around the 30s to the 70s, I believe it was, um, of the 1900s, and one in Detroit, Michigan, and the other in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Uh, just after their 50th wedding anniversary, his wife Elsie suffered a massive stroke that disabled her nearly completely. Nine months after the stroke, uh, with almost no improvement, Dr. Strauss began writing his well-known book, In God's Waiting Room. Let me read an excerpt from this book, if I could please. I have been teaching the Bible and preaching sermons and writing books for 45 years, but trial and tribulation are now my constant companions. Truth that I once knew intellectually and academically, I am now learning experientially. There is a great difference. I have been in God's waiting room since my wife had her stroke. Elsie remains paralyzed and she needs my love and care 24 hours a day. This business of waiting is one tough assignment. At times I have found it hard to wait. I get in a hurry and God seems to be so slow. Are you with me? We must stay, listen to this, this is good. We must stay in the reality of truth and put off the imagination of our feelings while we are in God's waiting room. We must stay in the reality of truth and put off the imagination of our feelings while we are in God's waiting room. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 3, the Bible says, and not only so, but we glory and tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. I've entitled the message this evening, Stupid Imaginations. Stupid Imaginations. Notice with me how David turned the rea uh, to the reality of truth and put off the imaginations of his feelings. First thing I want you to notice, number one, we'll see in verse number one and two, is David's problem. We see David's problem in verses number one and two. Look at verse number one with me. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? So the first thing I want you to notice is, A, under Roman number number one, is he felt abandoned. David felt abandoned in his life. He felt like God had completely forgotten him. He said here, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? And he follows up with a second question, forever? Are you going to forget me forever? It seems like forever. You know, we're not really sure when this is in David's life. All that would try to pinpoint a time would be mere speculation. But I would like to speculate tonight. And I believe that it's very possible this is right before David heads off to the land of the Philistines to that city called Ziklag to escape the hand of Saul. 
And so I don't think people, a lot of people realize, but David has at this point been anointed king by Samuel the prophet. He was just a teenage boy when that happened. He was just a young lad when he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. And all of this time, he's, he's, there's a period of time where he is growing up there. He becomes really the, the captain of Saul's armies. I mean, he defeats Goliath. He does amazing things. He's in favor with all the people of Israel. He handles himself wisely. And then Saul turns against him because Saul realizes that he's going to be the next king. And so David goes on the run. Now, nobody's really, there's nothing directly that says in the Bible how long David was on the run. But most speculate and say that it was between 7 and 12 years. Now listen to me. Not 7 to 12 days. Not 7 to 12 months even. 7 to 12 years, David is running for his life knowing that he's supposed to be the next king of Israel. And he's running from his king. And the only crime that he has committed is being anointed the next king of Israel. And it wasn't a crime. Only in the eyes of Saul, the one that's chasing him. Now we have just a few encounters between him and Saul where Saul's seeking his death. But 7 to 12 years, I'm guessing there's plenty that the scriptures have just been silent on. And can you imagine, I don't think anybody in here can understand the insurmountable amount of stress this man must have felt day in and day out running for his life. He must have just been under an extreme amount of stress knowing what he's dealing with and, 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 and all of these things that are taking place. And so as we look at this, we see this. It must have been a very difficult thing. I think this kind of helps us understand this passage a little bit. And I think it really kind of helps us understand the whole fact of why he went into the land of the Philistines. After 7 to 12 years, all of these things taking place. Now I want to jump in this. He's feeling completely forgotten by God. He goes, how long? Forever? Are you going to forget me forever? And now let me ask you this. Do you think God actually forgot David at all? No, No, not at all. But I am telling you right now, our emotions will mess with us. Our imaginations, when things aren't going the way we think they ought to be going, when things are hard and it seems like we're not hearing from God, we're not seeing God, we're not, we're not having anything happen in our lives, it is easy to let your imagination get the best of you. Isaiah chapter number 49, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child? That she should have not, uh, uh, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. This is God talking. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. God is saying, "Hey, listen, I'm not going to forget you. You're you're in my hands." I mean, I, listen. As we look at this, we see this. God does not forget His own. Can I get a witness? The situation of our lives can cause us to question, even to the point at times in our lives where we're under such a a distress that we can even begin to question our own salvation. But the truth is the truth, regardless of how we're feeling. Are you with me? No matter what we're going on, whatever happens to be going on in our circumstances, however we happen to be feeling about things, the way that we view things may not be the right way. Listen, if you hadn't noticed, we're sinful people. And the last I checked, I I don't think there's ever been a day in my life when I woke up and took that first breath of air and said, wow, I really am perfect. (laughs) That's never happened in my life. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Listen, I'm telling you right now, man, we can have things come in our lives and we begin to question these things. This stuff is real. David, a man after God's own heart, here is in great distress. And he is panicking, and his panic leads him to make some bad decisions. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I want you to see this. God does not forget his own. Second Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, 
in your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. When you get there, look at verse number 10, if you would please. Second Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also what? Live with him. If we what? Suffer, we shall also what? Reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, Yet he abideth what? He cannot what? Deny himself. If you're saved in here, say amen. amen. You are Christ. Amen. You're in Christ and he cannot deny himself. If he said that he would save you, you're saved. If he said that, listen, the bottom line is, did he not say it? Then you're born again. He cannot deny himself. The Bible, you know, the Bible says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He can't deny himself. He said it. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible goes on to say the memory of the just is what? Blessed. The memory of the just is blessed. And listen, when we're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, we have been justified by the blood of his precious son. And so very thankful for that. Amen. He felt abandoned, but not only did he feel abandoned, he also felt alone. He felt alone. He said, how long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? He said, how long will thou hide thy face from me? He felt alone. He felt not only abandoned. Now, was David alone at this whole time? Not physically, he wasn't. He had a group of people with him all the time. But listen, the truth of the matter is, is being in a position nobody else can understand. They weren't chasing, Saul wasn't chasing these other men. He was after David. Yep. He wanted David dead. Are you with me? Yep. And listen, there's, it, it's, it's very lonely to be in a place no one else can understand. It's very lonely to be in a situation like that. It's much like the ministry, being a pastor. Listen, until a person has actually pastored a church, they cannot relate. They do not understand what it is to be a pastor. They don't get the pressures and the, the intensity and the, the spiritual warfare that is dealt with. They don't get it. Listen, I asked John Herdman when he became the pastor of Grace Baptist Church. He'd been there for about maybe a few months, and I asked him, because he came from a church that was huge. He came from Franklin Lowe's Baptist Church. Mike Norris is the pastor. That's his yeah. brother-in-law. Huge church. He was the assistant pastor there. And I said, so uh, uh, what's it like being a pastor versus an assistant pastor? He said, man, this is so much different. He said, it is so much harder. I never knew how difficult this was. And this is a man that was an assistant pastor to a man that pastored a monstrous church on one of the bigger churches in our country for fundamental independent Baptists. Are you with me? There, nobody understands what it is to pastor until they're pastor. Only a pastor can relate with a pastor. The closest one they can is my wife. She's the one that can the most because she sees it. She's, she's around it, but she still don't get the intensity. Man, it'll just flat wear you out, and you're not even doing anything. You just, spiritual warfare is intense. Listen, he felt alone. One of the two reasons for this feeling alone, one of the two reasons why God will turn his face from you. Number one, God has you right where he wants you. God has you right where he wants you. And there's really a couple of reasons within sight of that reason. He's got you right where he wants you, and he's being silent to you, and he's hiding himself from you for a particular purpose and a reason. And that is to put you in a position to see what you're going to do when you don't hear from God. Will you just continue to stay and do what's right, or will you continue to try and figure out your own way? Come on, come on. He does that. Come on. And so, and another reason is, is because he's already told you everything he wants you to know for the time and just stick and do. Just do it. You say, well, I got this coming up in my life and God's not giving me a word on it. Don't do anything then. Just continue to do what you know you're supposed to do. Are you with me? You just do what you know you're supposed to do. I haven't heard from God. Well, then don't go anywhere. Don't do it. Listen, don't make a stupid decision and get yourself out of God's will. Amen? 
And that is the truth of it. We make so many decisions in life that God has absolutely nothing to do with. And the reason is, is because we feel pressure from the world to make a decision. And the devil does pressure us and try to get us to make decisions that should never be made. Are you with me? Listen, I'm telling you right now, you got to be careful about this. When you're in a situation and you're praying about something and God's not answering you, listen, there's a reason why God's not giving you an answer. There's a reason why God's not giving you direction on it. There's a reason why God's, listen, we try to force and push and, and make the way for things to happen in our life. And the bottom line is, is we need to just stand still and wait on the Lord and see the salvation of our God. Amen. That's what we're supposed to do is just continue to do the things you know you're supposed to do. You read your Bible, you pray, and you go, you talk to people about Jesus and you be faithful to church and you live the standard of life. You don't drop your standards when, when I, well, I'm not hearing from God. So this must not matter anymore. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Live by principle. Have character. Yes. Godly character is so vitally important. Are you with me? Amen. And so you just continue to do the same thing. You know what happens so many times? It's because my devotion seems to be dead and God doesn't really open my eyes to anything and, 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 and everything seems to be dark right now. And so you know what they stop doing? They stop reading their Bible and they stop praying. And what happens right there? Now, all of a sudden, it's no longer God putting you through a time and a period of testing. All of a sudden, now, his face is being turned from you because of sin in your life. Yeah. Then, you're in a really bad place because now you're doubled up. Are you with me? Now you're doubled up. Now you're in a bad spot. And man, that's a dangerous place to be. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long? He felt abandoned. He felt alone. Listen, Isaiah chapter number 59, verse number two. The first reason is God has you right where he wants you. The second reason is, is you have sin in your life. If you're not hearing from God, it's one of these two reasons. And these are the only two reasons. Isaiah 59 2 says this, but your iniquities have separated you uh, between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. How long? Well, until you decide to repent and get right with God. Until you decide to say, you know what? I need to do what David did in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Can I get a witness? Until you're willing to do that, listen, you're just going to be walking in the dark. And you don't know where you're going to run into because you can't see. Listen, it's a lonely place to be in places where nobody else understands. And I get it. That's a dangerous place to be. Sometimes you feel all alone and you've got people all around you. And listen, the bottom line is, is you better stay upon your God and do what you know is right, regardless of if it feels like he's there or not. Because your feelings and your imagination will deceive you. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen to this. Casting down what? Imaginations. Casting down what? Imaginations. You got to get good at casting down imaginations because you'll have imaginations creep into your heart and mind over and over and over again. If you don't think the devil's not busy trying to plant some seed of doubt in your imaginations, and that's the fertile ground that he can do that in, is getting you thinking, well, I don't think the pastor really likes me that much. Let me break. Man, I'm telling you something right now. I like everybody in this room. I like you a lot. Amen? I love each and every one of you. Listen to me. Imaginations, they get creeping up in your mind, and the next thing you know, you're having all these crazy thoughts. And before you know it, those thoughts are getting you to do things that you shouldn't be doing. Those imaginations get you to make wrong decisions. And it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of who? God. Listen, you better turn to the reality of the truth and put off of the, uh, the, the uh, 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 what did I call it? Something in the imaginations. And put off the imaginations of your feelings. There we go. And listen, you got to put that stuff off. 
you got to get back to the truth. Jesus said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. Hey, listen, there's been plenty of times I've, I've seen people that had people uh, that were around them, and they didn't even know they were there, but they were there. How many times have you seen somebody get in trouble and somebody come to their rescue just at the last moment? They didn't even know that person was there, didn't even know that person existed, didn't even know that person. And all of a sudden, here's somebody here to rescue them. Are you with me? I watched a video on YouTube. It was about these uh, uh, dog rescues and stuff. This dog was caught, had gotten loose with his chain. He was on a railroad track and a train was coming. This guy come down and rescued that. I mean, last, I mean, just within seconds of getting crushed, him and the dog barely rescued that dog. That dog didn't know that guy was there for he come out of the woods and come running over and grab that dog out of there just at the last second. Man, are you with me? Listen, just because you feel alone, if you're a child of God, say amen. You are never alone. You've never been abandoned. God does not abandon his own. Listen, <laughs> When you, there's, there's two reasons why you might not be hearing from God. God has you right where he wants you, and he's just going to leave you right there, and you just keep doing the things you know you're supposed to do. And when God has more marching orders for you, he'll let you know. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And until then, you just stay upon your God and do what you're supposed to do. And so, and otherwise, if you've got sin in your life, get it right, and God will begin to speak Amen. to you again. Good. Listen, Satan always tries to do this. The longer you feel alone, the more likely you are to take your own counsel. And that is when you are in trouble. Look at what it says, what he's doing here. He says, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? How, how, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my what? He's taking his own counsel. That's a dangerous place to be. Having sorrow in my heart. He's got sorrow in his heart, and he's taking his own counsel. And you know what? This is what David did when he went into the land of the Philistines. He's like, he, he told himself in his own heart, he said, I'm, I'm going to die at the hand of Saul one day. That's what he said. And I understand it had been 7 to 12 years this man had been running from King Saul. I get it. God delivered him over and over again. David had chosen at this point in time in his life to not remember what God had done and how God had delivered and how God had provided. He didn't remember when Abigail came running out, out after everything that Nabal did, that evil man. And she brought all the food and everything. David was getting ready to go wipe out the entire household and take what he wanted. Can you imagine what it must have been like? The imaginations of his heart had gotten him in a place where he was getting ready to do something he shouldn't do. Are you with me? And praise God, God sent this woman out to stop him from doing what would be a black mark in his kingdom. And it's, he, she did. Praise the Lord. God delivered him. But David, when he went into the land of the Philistines, let me ask you this. If you know the story, did he need to go into the land of the Philistines? You want to know Why? Because at that same time, Saul just left him. And then what happened? The Philistines began to attack Israel. And he went to battle. And guess who died within that battle? King Saul did. So David just did. Why did God not answer David? Why did God not give David direction on where to go? Because he didn't need to. Stay where you're at, David. But that's not what David did. David went in the land of the Philistines, wiped out an entire city, made sure everybody was dead so the word wouldn't get to the Philistines, and then pretended to be the king of the Philistines' servant. And he almost ended up going to war with the Philistines against his own people. I wonder how that would have worked out, being the next king. It would have been a mess. And then it also costs him because he comes back to the camp after they send him back away because the, the princes of the Philistines are like, we're not going. He could reunite with his king and turn on us. Are you crazy? And that's exactly what probably would have ended up happening is David wouldn't have fought his own people. And so anyways, he goes back. And what does he do? He finds out that everybody, all the women and the children and the stuff is all gone from Ziklag. And fortunately, he's like, finally, he stops taking his own counsel. He gets the ephod and he encourages himself in the Lord. And the Lord says, go get him and you'll recover all. 
And so what do they do? They go get him and recover all. But look at all the drama he had to go through. He had all of his men. They were ready to stone him. That wasn't the way he felt on that matter. They were. (laughs) They were ready to kill him. They were upset. And you know what he did? He went and got the ephah, and God delivered him from that. He felt alone. And boy, when you feel alone, when you feel abandoned, there's, there's a time right there. If you're not careful, you'll make wrong decisions. And not only did he feel abandoned and alone, he also felt abased. Look at verse number two with me again. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long shall my, and notice it's singular, enemy shall be exalted over me. How long am I going to have to deal with King Saul reigning over me? I'm supposed to be the next king. Or I've been anointed. You have clearly shown me this. You not only clearly shown me this, even King Saul, when he had cut the skirt off the robe, said, told David, you shall surely be the next king. Promise me that you won't wipe out my, my uh, uh, bloodline. You know, he made a promise. David made a promise to him. And what does he do? Comes after him again. I mean, come on. Dumb as a box of rocks, man. And so anyways, we stop and we look at this. He felt abased. He felt like he was being held back. And I can only imagine what David must have felt like. You know, the time that he went down to the, to the edge and had his, grabbed the spear and, and the bolster of the king and took it up out of the thing? I wonder what he felt about seeing the well-armed and armed men, the tent and all the things that they had, knowing that Saul was, was living in a palace and seeing the, the prosperity of, of his family and everything that was going on, and he's supposed to be the king. While he's running around with a ragtag group of men that were the lowest of the group, these were all disgruntled people that joined himself to him. And he wasn't one of these type of people. I mean, he, he had come from a good family. He was a shepherd boy. And now all of a sudden, he's got a bunch of gripers and complainers running around with him in the wilderness that they, they, were, they were leaving because of debt. They were leaving because of all of those things. And, and that's the bottom line as we think about that. And so I'm just sitting here thinking, he's looking at all this. He's seeing all these things. And he's like, man, what in the world? He's feeling very abased, very low. He's feeling bad. Lord, why isn't, why, isn't, why isn't this taking place? Why, why haven't I become king yet? You promised me. Are you with me? He felt abased. He felt alone. And he felt abandoned. David's problem. But I also want you to notice David's petition. David's petition. Consider and hear me, O Lord. My God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Now, it's always important to turn to God. Can I get a witness? It's always important to pray to the Lord and talk to God. It's always important. But I don't really want to talk about that in this moment. What I want to talk is about what his prayers revealed. What his petitions revealed? The first thing I want you to know is his, his fear is revealed in this petition. His fear is revealed. He says, consider and hear me like God didn't, David. Have you become so imaginative in your mind that you don't even think God's listening to you? That you don't even think God hears what you have to say? Really, David? You're the anointed kid. You're the next in line. God has been highly favoring you. I mean, God has blessed you. You killed Goliath. You have the praise of the people. You went out and in, and you handled yourself wisely in Saul's kingdom. You were the greatest captain of the army of Israel that they ever had. And you see all of this, and now all of a sudden, because he hasn't been crowned the king yet, and because he's still running for his life, he begins to forget all of those things. And he, we see here, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He says, lighten mine eyes. David felt like God wasn't listening. He asked for light. He needed direction from God, or he felt he was a dead man. I've got to have direction or Saul's going to get me. He said, I'm surely going to die at the hand of Saul now. God's not even answering me. And this is why he ran off into the land of the Philistines. I believe this. I think this is what happened and caused him to do it. 
But God didn't need to give him any direction because Saul's about to die and he's about to become the king. <laughs> Look at this now. Go to Luke chapter number 11 with me. I want you to see this. The light of the eye. He was asking for his eyes to be enlightened. It's always exciting to me as a pastor when I'm preaching and I see somebody's eyes go in that little sparkle in their eyes like, wow, I just got this. I just got something I hadn't seen before. That is thrilling when I see that take place when I'm preaching. Uh, I mean, it is a thrill to me because you see the light of the eye. You see that enlightenment. It's an exciting thing to have happen, amen? Look at verse number 33 of the text. This is a parallel passage to Matthew. Verse number 33, No man, when he lighteth a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a what? But on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the what? The light of the body is the what? Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of what? When thy eye is single. But when thy eye is what? You notice he didn't say double. You can tie that right into Matthew 2 where it says, can a man serve two masters? And he calls that actually evil. Thy body also is full of what? When you're divided and you're not singular in your life, the Bible says you're full of darkness and you cannot see. That's a scary place to be. The light of the body is the eye, therefore if thine eye be single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not what? Darkness. Darkness. In other words, you need to get your eyes singular. You need to get your eyes singular. You ever, has anybody ever in here had like double vision? You ever had double vision where it, all of a sudden one eye gets turned off the side or something like that? That is like nauseating, is it not? You want your eyes to be what? Single focused on one item at a listen are you with me and boy i'm telling you your heart your your life is to be about one thing love the lord thy god with all thine heart with all thy soul and with all thy might amen this is the first commandment and this is what we ought to be is single and so we see david's problem we see david's position his fear is revealed in this passage his fear is revealed. He's feared that God has not hearing him. God has forgotten him. He's crying out to God to hear. He says in this passage, O oh Lord my God, light mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He thinks he's going to die if he doesn't get some direction from God. David, you're not going to die. You don't need. You're making a big deal out of something that's not a big deal. You're delivered already and you don't even know it. Stop letting your imagination get away from you, David. Amen. Have I not protected you all along the way? Have not I guided you and, and kept you from raising your hand against Saul? Have not I done all these things? Have not I given you victory after victory after victory in battle? It wasn't because you're all that in a bag of chips, David. It's because I'm your God. That's why. And I got a plan for your life. And listen, if you're saved in here, say Amen. God has a plan for your life. He's got a plan for you. And man, I'm telling you something right now. Well, I sure wish he'd show it to me. If he showed you his plan for you, it'd blow your mind and you'd probably be scared half to death. You couldn't handle the fear from it. Are you with me? Man, who would have Listen, back when I was Tanner's age, if God would have showed me, me pastoring a church at this age, I'd have been like, oh, I couldn't say, listen, when I was his age, I couldn't say two words without stumbling all over myself. Somebody say hi to me. I'd be like, uh, uh, yeah, hi. That's how backwards I was. I was a mess when I was younger. 
man, I couldn't even think straight. I was just like, I was always nervous somebody was going to say hello to me because I'd have to come up with the word hello out of my mouth. And I, it was that bad until I went in the army and they beat me half to death and ran me half to death and screamed me half to death. And finally, Perfect. finally, Perfect. it was, it was, amen. I needed it real bad. And so <laughs> that's what, that's what pulled me out of that craziness. Man. <laughs> People used to, uh, adults, would, like my dad's friends, when, 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 when uh, I was working with him and stuff like that, you know, one of his friends by the name of Mike, he worked with the Border Patrol, I can't remember his name, I think he passed away of cancer or something, but anyways, this guy used to come around, and he'd, he'd go over to my dad, hey, 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 look over there, look, look at him, look at him, and I'd be over there. <laughs> I'm serious, I was just like, woo! out of it. I'm like, God help me. Man, that's the way I was. I was just like, hey. <laughs> that was your pastor. <laughs> and so if you see me that sometimes, well, still every now and then I'll be like in deep thought. Yeah, shut up, son. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm telling you, it's crazy. And so it, he used to get the biggest kick out of it. How you doing today, Jim? And he'd, he'd wait. He'd be like, is he going to say something? Or... <laughs> oh, man. I just, you know, my brain hadn't matured or something. I don't know. I'm still working on that, I think. But anyways, and so it revealed his fear. It revealed his fear. He felt like he was going to be a dead man. And he felt like his enemies were going to overcome him, lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when? When I shall be moved. Look at what it says. Not only do we see his fear revealed, but also in this petition, we also see his frailty revealed. When I am moved. Not if I get moved. But it was already in David's heart that he was going to move. It was already in David's heart that he knew that he was going to move. That he was going to change. That he was going to stop trusting. That he was going to do his own thing. Are you with me? When I am moved. It was already there. David had already made his decision. He's crying out to God, but God already knows what he's going to do. That's right. And when you've already made a decision of what you're going to do and there's no change in it, what does God have to say about it? Are you with me? If you've already made a decision about what you're going to do and there's no change in that, what's the point of God saying something to you? It's just going to heap on more trouble for you. It's just like this. If your pastor sees something in your life, and I already know you're going to do it anyways, why in the world would I make you upset with me by telling you don't do it? <laughs> Are you with me? I learned my lesson the hard way the first few years of this church. I was like, these people are going to make a mess out of their life. I go talk to them about it, and bam, they hated me forever. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Listen. If you're going to make decisions before you get counsel, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're just asking for trouble. And the multitude of counselors there is what? Safety. His frailty is revealed. Go to Isaiah chapter number 50 with me. Isaiah chapter number 50. This is God's decree about this matter. When you decide to do things in your own wisdom and in your own strength, when you decide to do things in your own power, when you decide to not wait on God and just go ahead of God and decide you're going to do this and that and everything else, this is the end of that conversation. This is what takes place. Isaiah chapter number 50, if you would, please. Look at verse number 10 when you get there. It's a powerful passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter number 50, verse number 10. Verse number 10. When you're there, say Amen. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his what? Hmm. That walketh in what? 
and hath no light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and do what? Stay upon his God. So who of you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh not in darkness, that walketh in darkness and hath no light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Verse number 11, Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in what? This is what happens when people take matters into their own hands and do not, one, hearken to the voice of the Lord's servant and walk in the light of their own fire. If you're in darkness, it's not time to try and light a fire. You wait on God. You stay upon God. And you just do what you know you're supposed to do and you keep doing it. Because you go ahead and light that fire and you begin to do things your own way. You'll be in trouble. You mark it down, you're going to be in trouble. David's problem, David's petition. His petition revealed his fear and it revealed his frailty. He was already being moved. He was already in a place where he was not supposed to be. And you see what happens in that situation when he goes off to Ziklag. He ends up killing a bunch of people that he shouldn't have killed. He ends up serving a king he shouldn't have been serving. He ends up losing his family and his kids and everything. But praise be to God, even after all of those mistakes, God was still gracious when he called out to God for help. Amen. God delivered all that stuff yeah. back to him. Amen? Great. And so when you make those kind of mistakes and you do those kind of stupid things, get right with God. Don't keep going in the wrong direction. Amen? Well, I know I'm going to get to Bell Fountain sometime, and you're halfway over to California going the wrong way. Well, I, I just made it. I, how did I get to the Pacific Ocean? Because you didn't turn around. Are you with me? I think I'll get to Bell Fountain. I'm going to get on a boat, and I'll get to Bell Fountain that way. And the next thing you know, you'll be a, a slave in China. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. Amen. It's crazy. David's problem, David's position, and lastly, David's proclamation. Look at verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. This is where David gets things kind of back together. Verse 5 and 6. Listen. We've said it. Stay upon your God. Verse 5 and 6. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. We see David's proclamation. We see his proclaimed, he proclaimed his faith in God. Verse number five, he proclaimed his faith in God, but I have trusted in thy mercy. It's a good thing because you just made a bunch of mistakes. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. What does he do? He encourages himself in the Lord. He remembers who his God is. He remembers the salvation his God has provided to him. He remembers that his God is merciful. And I'm going to trust in that mercy to help me through all of this. And I'm going to turn back to my God. And that's exactly what we need to do when we find ourselves in a mess. Hebrews chapter number 13, 5 and 6. We've got to remember these things. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is God enough or isn't he? So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my what? Helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Can I get a witness? He is, God is enough. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He proclaimed his faith in God and he also proclaimed God's faithfulness to him. Verse number 6, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Yes, he has, David. He has dealt bountifully with you. While you were in the wilderness wanderings, you got married, you got kids, you got stuff, you got, you got people around you to help protect you, to help fight, to provide for you, all of these things. And because you didn't raise your hand against the anointed king at that time, you became king. 
Psalm 116, 7, Return unto the re thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Do you feel like you just can't get any rest? I'm not talking about sleep. I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about at rest in the Lord. Peace. Having return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. He says, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Turn to Lamentations chapter number 3 and we're done. Lamentations chapter number 3. He reminded himself that God has been faithful to him. And when you're in a low point in your life, you better do this. You better, you better get confidence in your salvation. You better remember your salvation. You better proclaim your faith in him. I've trusted in the Lord. He's never failed me. And I'm pretty sure he's not going to start now, even though it feels like it. You don't let the imaginations of your feelings get you off track. Limitation chapter number 3, verse number 21. Look at what it says. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I what? Hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions do what? They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Can I get a witness? He is enough. Saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, Lord. I pray you'd help us tonight. I pray, Father, that you'd help us not to walk in the light of our own fire. Help us not to kindle our own sparks. Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd help us to just stay upon you, help us to be faithful in times when it seems like you're nowhere to be found. Lord, help us. Lord, help us to be quick to wait on thee and slow to act on our own understandings. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to look to you for direction. Father, I'm thankful that your word says the steps of a good man are ordered by you. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to allow you to order our steps. Help us to be faithful. Help us to walk in truth. Help us not to be, leave the lies of Satan. Help us to cast down those imaginations that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Father, I pray you bless now this invitation. I pray you do the work in hearts and lives that needs to be done. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. If God spoke to your heart, slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven. God sees those hands. You can put them down. If God spoke to your heart, the piano's playing. You come on. Only trust him, amen. Trust in Jesus. Don't you believe the lies of the propaganda that's being pumped into the ears of every American across this nation and around the world? Because it is just that, it's lies. Trust Jesus. He's faithful. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. God's enough.